Oops. Five after. I don't see any sign of Ned. And can we go ahead and start? And uh, Gary, can you confirm? Do you have audio? Yes, I do. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that's fine. Um, and if I understand right, uh, Michael is only half here. Uh, Michael, can you hear us? Is it... I'm only half here. Yeah. I'll probably have you on mute while the other people are talking. <laughs> I mean, out, outbound. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you can see chat and stuff if, if we need to get your attention. Yeah. Uh, um, so, Michael, did you want me to project today? Is that what you were asking when I was joining? Yeah, yeah, because I, I can't do both. I can't listen and talk and listen. All right. Let me see if I can do that then. Thanks, Dave. Can people see my screen? Yep, looks good. Okay, and let me get uh, the chat window up down in the corner here. We don't want overlap with too much. All right. Uh, I have no idea what to go to. Does anybody else have a preference for what to spend time on today? I think all of these are in. Um, uh, lots of discussion where people don't like them. So, what? Any suggestions on what might be productive today? I... So, this is Hank uh, speaking for uh, Thomas and Hank. I think um, we uh, um, uh, agreed to create something based on your comments, Dave, for the uh, PR um, ninety-seven. And no, sorry, I'm, I'm blind. It's uh, eighty-seven. And, uh, but, uh, or maybe, sorry, it's 99. Ah, so many freshness thingies here. Um, but we did not do it. <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, so we have not uh, pro progressed on that. So we can skip. Uh, if, if there's no, no real, real hard uh, pressure right. today, uh, that one. Yeah. Right. When I checked last night, I think the bottom ones hadn't been updated yet. And so. Uh, 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 there are two items that are not PRs, uh, which I would like to uh, highlight on, okay. which uh, one of them <laughs> is uh, uh, Kathleen's points. We have to address them at some point. And is so there an issue, to... is there an issue filed on that? No, and she wrote two emails with a lot of uh, issues, so to speak. Um, so I have to ask in this group, how do we want to address these? Uh, I wrote a preliminary answer that was just Hank. Um, so that's not a, a normative <laughs> reply or a, a representative answer here. And so uh, we have to either, I don't know, segregate uh, uh, editorials from content and then create issues here or go through the email. Maybe it's a redundant work to uh, create separate issues for what she has as issues in her email. So it might just be a waste of time. I don't know. And uh, so first thing are uh, Kathleen's two emails here. And second thing is also Hannes reviewed it. It's, it's very smaller email, uh, so maybe it's easier to address, but these items are not here in the GitLab. Uh, therefore, I wanted to highlight them uh, uh, verbally. So I will suggest two things. Um, the convention that I have followed in other working groups, like uh, TEEP or whatever, is the things that are technical, I would file an issue on. The things that are editorial, either I would just address them in a pull request and not file an issue, or if we think it's going to take a while, then it's okay to file an issue that covers all the editorial stuff in one issue. But I don't think that's necessary. Um, but for the uh, technical stuff, I would put that in a separate issue from any editorial stuff. And, it would, and ideally separate the technical issues like you were saying. Okay, what I can do then, because I already read the first email, yeah. is for next Tuesday to create technical issues as I hope I'm doing this right. So please yeah. supervise me a little bit. Sanity check me here yeah. uh -huh. um, in the GitLab for us to discuss next week. Okay. But only first email uh, because that is lower hanging fruit for me. Is there anything in Kathleen? So I said I was going to suggest two things. The other thing is, is there? I was going to ask, is there anything in Kathleen's mail or Hannes's mail that is uh, useful for us to discuss this week by projecting the actual email? Uh, yeah, maybe uh, uh, Hannes's thingy. Uh, I, I, 
if you haven't read that, Hannes basically says uh, in a nutshell. Hank, wow. uh, can you bring it up on the screen? Would you like to share your screen to just uh, uh, bring it? Because I don't have it handy. But if you have it handy, then I'll let oh. you bring it. No, I cannot. I am a, uh, I am a tablet user. Oh, okay. uh, no okay. email on my tablet. Um, yeah, because WebEx, Linux, and you know, so I, I just. All right, all right. Let me, let me stop it. sharing for a second. Let me, because you said Hannah. So let me give me a minute to see if I can uh, find it here. I think it's useful to discuss. I think if it's something we can make rapid progress on, then it's probably worth doing it and not waiting because we can generate a pull request and. So yeah, I, I think we can do rapid progress on this, but I don't want to um, um, spoil anyone here uh, anymore. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, I think it's important to to reply because it would be weird not to reply. But uh, I did not feel that I can speak for everybody without having talked with the people here. So uh, I um, did not. It's from today. Uh, it's from probably like a few hours only. Okay, I uh, should be sharing my screen, and I see uh, two of these. Hi all. Yeah, hi all is uh, more. Um, they both are hi all. Left, left, left one. To the right. Left, left one. Right one we can address as issues actually I think, uh, but the that's the right one. Sorry, the left one is the actual thing that I think warrants a reply. Okay. So let me see if I can get this on the screen. Uh, there and. I can make it any slightly bigger here. So it'll be 125. Okay. Yeah, readable okay. for me now. Uh, all right, there we go. Um, so I don't know if everybody has read this. So let's that's just short enough. Uh, in the very short, yeah. Yeah. The document is unnecessarily hard to read and understand. Basic form. Okay, that's bad news because I'm using this document for, for a lot of our internal work and I'm referring back to it as authoritative. So. Yep. Yeah, I'm doing the same thing too. I, I don't find it so complex. In fact, with stuff like IMA, you just you just need stuff like evidence. I mean, it's hard to not have it. Yeah, I don't know yet how his uh, comments are actionable at all, except here he suggests something that I don't think we agree in. I think, it's, I think yeah. and, uh, and I have a sense based on our decent attendance from these meetings and our previous presentations to RATS that we do have a uh, uh, working group consensus on terms like, you know, evidence, attestation results, and dot, 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 and so on. So. I agree. This, this, this email can be action, I think. The other one, maybe, but this one is just, uh, you know, Hannes venting. So yeah, I think this one may just warrant a response. And Hank, you, did you already respond to this one, or you responded to the other one? No, no, no I have not. I have not responded to uh, Hannes' okay. mail. So okay. Only to Kathleen's first okay. one, okay. because I think okay. yes, this one is not actionable. I think also, well, but I wanted to bring the only up action he suggests is one that uh, would go against what we believe is working group consensus. Yes, correct. And certainly, the design team is consensus, but design team consensus doesn't matter. But working group consensus, we believe it's not consistent with. Um, yeah, now his uh, unnecessarily hard to read and understand. He doesn't make any actionable ways to improve that. So, all right. So, so um, I, I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, I think there's a few areas I would like to see simplified, but I generally agree with the, the, uh, you know, evidence and verifier and result and, and all that. And and I do think some of the text has got really long sentences that are really hard to 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 read and understand. So, um, I mean, I and I'd like to see us do something about them. I find them, you know, I don't know how to do that, but that's been that's been an issue with this document all along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, the 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 twenty word rule uh, has to be applied at some point uh, thoroughly, and we have to cut complicated sentences up and make it way more readable if, if people really can actually not or can have multiple interpretations of the same text that would be bad mm -hmm. so um and, and convoluted text sometimes i'm writing this worm sentences i know some some are on me <laughs> i'm pretty sure about that uh, so uh, yes but that is an editorial thing yeah. i think uh, it is not an action about uh, the content effectively yeah. so like um, if, you, if you mentioned like a specific 
paragraph or even a specific section or something, um, or rather than just the document, it would be easier. So I guess uh, maybe we can follow up because I, it sounds like what we're summarizing is we agree that we believe that the uh, uh, terms are important and that the work we believe that the working group thinks so too. And uh, if he can call out any specific uh, paragraphs or sections that he thinks are hard to read, then uh, we, the editors, can work on some editorial changes to try to clean up those things. That's probably how I would respond to it. Mm -hmm. That's what I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, he has this. Wait, I, to, yeah, I can, I can actually I can create from this here. I also, when I do Kathleen stuff, I think uh, there are uh, three, at least three use cases highlighted here. I can create issues from these if you want. In his uh, second mail you're talking about? Yeah, yeah exactly. He's talking about specific cases. sections and stuff. Yeah. yeah exactly. So I, I can, this is more actionable, as we said, and I can try to, uh, uh, yeah, well, just churn it for next time. So I will do some typing, a lot of typing. Okay. Uh, this case is fine. Yep. The added value. Okay. I mean, Scanning through to see, is there anything else that people want to discuss on the call today about this one that might be easy to do before next week or even during the call if it's trivial? So, uh, this is the section that I contributed text for. So, um, I guess if you file an issue on this one, you can assign it to me. Uh, that's three fourth critical infrastructure control. This one might have come from me too, but I don't think I was the only person. I don't know if this one was actually in Michael's document uh, before I provided some text on it, but I think I provided the text that's in there right now. But I was using information from people at uh, my company, but also I don't think I'd heard about it first from them. I was I heard about it first from a different company. And so uh, I'll have to follow his link to see. Um, what the different meaning is, and maybe it's actually the same meeting. It's just a problem in the text. I mean, is it? A, I mean, is it a watchdog with a timer and a bite? Is that? I, I'm not looking at the section in front of me, but uh, oh. is that what? Um, is that what this refers to? Well, the, if, if so, uh, yeah. I mean, I can understand the ARM and Qualcomm when, when we think of watchdog timers, they're trying to see the uh, processor is hung. For some reason, uh, right? So no, the, the the case that I'm familiar with, and uh, I believe it was a company called uh, Sequitur Labs that has ARM-based products, and they use a TEE, and they monitor code pages in the uh, rich execution side kernel, code pages and data pages, and if they see a change in those pages that aren't supposed to be changed then they will immediately reboot the machine and reflash the kernel and stuff. So basically they reject the, the TEE is watching the REE for uh, sanity checking anything that should get, that could go wrong. But that's nothing okay. to do with that. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, that's, I don't remember that might not, I'd have to look back at the text in this section. I'm just saying this term hardware watchdog um, is where I've heard them and they, maybe it's not the right term or whatever. I have to go back and see what section 3.6 says because like i said i it might be combining a couple concepts so yeah i don't i don't think anything like that belongs in the architecture document okay so okay if, if there's, there's not a super pressing need uh we don't have to go into detail today yep. uh, um i think i will provide the uh, issues uh, except everything that was fine uh maybe there was one i think um, so, uh, I will create appropriate issues and, uh, I will, uh, hate myself for saying I will do so. So, um, yeah. you, uh, oh, thanks, I'll thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you for volunteering. Is there anything in, uh, Kathleen's mail that we should pull up on the screen and scan through? No, no, it's, it's, that is, that is high volume. Uh, that is why I think we have to really, okay. really uh, differentiate okay. that. I would not do this today, but I wanted to bring this, uh, logic, uh, logistical steps before. I think it was quite fast. Thank you for addressing. Mm -hmm. And uh, doing that, Dave. Well, thank you for volunteering. I, I, I like running things when you volunteer to do work. So, sure. <laughs> or when so anybody I, me, yeah. <laughs> don't get used to that. So. <laughs> uh, 
Um, okay, so I understand, Hank, you, you don't think it's worth covering the bottom stuff, and so we can defer that. And so, uh, uh, Thomas or Lawrence, uh, do you want to talk us through this? What I'd like to do um, is I'd like to kind of understand what everybody thinks endorsements are. Um, I don't have a very clear picture what the consensus are on endorsements. So I'd like to ask some questions and get some answers from the to understand the consensus here. Not so much about going over the the, the PR, but just, and then I'll take another shot at the um, PR. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll just go into this picture right here. Which. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to jump in. First of all, um, uh, the, the key material. Uh, um, so my understanding is that. Verifier has to have key material to verify the signature or somehow verify the secure conveyance of the evidence. Um, that uh, that key material has to come comes through an endorsement. Is that right? No, it typically comes from an endorsement, but it does not need to. Okay, so for example, then it could then be it, comes... it could be individually set up with each attester to the verifier. So if you think about like a uh, a maker, right? So the maker doesn't yeah. have a separate manufacturer, right? They might be running their own verifier and they individually pair the attester and the verifier at the time they put the little uh, gadget together. And so there's not any separate endorser in that sense or endorsements, they're just, you know, optional. That is a particular trivial use case where, you know, you've only got five devices and you've got a verifier and each one of them is an attester and you just don't use endorsements in this particular scenario because you have to pair every attester and you put the key material for each attester into the verifier yourself. Okay. It's, special. it's not the normal case, right? Because it's the normal case we have the mass market manufacturers and stuff, and then it matches, you know, manufacturer equals endorser and so on. It's not always required in tiny cases. So, so I, I'm I may be off. I mean, I mean, I I don't really understand. You know, I I, I suspect an endorsement means a very specific thing thing in the TCG world, and uh, so I, I, and I don't know really what that is. Um, um, Somebody from TCG want to comment on that? Then? No, I don't want to ask that question. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, what I what I what I believe is somehow in an architecture diagram, the fact that key material goes into the verifier has to be shown in the architecture diagram. There has to be one of those two arrows, either endorsements or appraisal policy. The, those are the only two arrows that go into the verifier. One of those two has to have the key material. Okay. If you put it. If you put it that way, another way to model it would be um, the endorser is just a human and endorsements is the human configuring the key material in the verifier via some mechanism like a tool running on the machine of the verifier. Yeah. That's a big example. And so endorsement is just you're manually supplying it on the client line, right? Saying here's the uh, the the key file or whatever and import this into the verifier and, and you know, save it. Um, this thing, I would, I would still assume that from an architectural point of view, I hope that the endorser is, I don't know, a service or a, a acting computing system or something in the end. No. But you're absolutely no. right. I think humans are involved. Yeah. It, so that it, is why I'm it, asking. It, in the really general case, in the general case, it need not be a service. Absolutely does not need to be. It is typical for scalability where it's a service, but that's under my definition. If you guys have different definitions, let me know. I'm trying to make sure that we're expansive to many different variations. So. Oh, if you have a typical, I'm fine. But I hope you're not rising appraisal policy on a napkin all the time. So uh, that's my 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 point. And you'd say, well, that's that's why why I went to a napkin and and and, and, and <laughs> the right right way. It's fine. Yeah, but I think yeah, if it's not just allowing this allowing having a service and saying if you want to scale a thing, you probably have this why, a service. I'm fine. Uh, I like the text, which is you know an endorser is typically a manufacturer, and you know. As long as we use the word typically, I think it's true because it is the typical case, right? Where it's a service and it's a manufacturer and so on. But um, there's other ways to do it. And so we don't want to do it by way of constraint. That's my opinion anyway. Okay. So, and, 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 and Lawrence, I saw you, are, uh, you use a USB stick sometimes, and I'm absolutely for air gapping stuff with USB sticks occasionally. So, um, so I see your, your, your napkin scenario here. And I'm not <laughs> against that. I'm just saying this is not the, the, the general rule here. Yeah, I mean, so the general the, the the general rule is that that key material has to get into the verifier, and uh, and I guess I'm so, asking how does the key material get into the verifier if it's not an endorsement? So therefore, any any way that key material going going into the verifier that's an endorsement. 
So we, if you want to have a, if you don't like it because it conflicts with the TCG definition of endorsement, then draw and we'll line in and say, yeah. here's the comes in. There isn't, there isn't a TCG definition of endorsement. In fact, the TCG are considering using the term endorsement because the ITF is using it in this diagram. What's really, what really I think is we're trying to talk about is how did the trust relationships between the various roles get set up and an, an endorser, the verifier needs to trust the endorser. It needs to trust the verifier owner. The relying party needs to trust the verifier. Right. The, those, those trust relationships have to be set up somehow as a prerequisite to this diagram. And we have a section on trust policy. I don't know that it goes into the, the level of detail, but at the end of the day, the reason that the verifier trusts the key that's embedded in the attester is because there is a pre-existing trust relationship with the manufacturer, aka endorser, and it's walking a, you know, just walking a, a trust anchor back to, or it's walking the, the uh, attester's certificate back to a common trust anchor with that the verifier has with the endorser. Right. You you allow for the case with no certificate, right? I understand that there's the case for no certificate, but we're talking about trust and I'm using PKI as an example for how trust relationships get established using symmetric cryptography. Yeah, and okay. there can be equivalence to that, obviously, with symmetric cryptography and whatever, and, you know, raw, raw keys and, and all that. Um, you know, if you want to enumerate all of them, fine, we can do that. But they, they, they all end up solving the same problem, which is establishment of an a priori trust relationship and that was a think, uh, prerequisite uh, to this diagram that's an interesting uh, subset of this is uh, they they fought about this for ages in in uh, netconf where is this uh, yang trust anchor uh, id and they basically uh, highlight a lot of cases so there could be a good example for us to refer to because the pki certificate the cms blob and even the uh, uh, ssh public key is uh, referred to as a trust anchor there. And therefore, uh, it is a little bit of a different scope. Maybe we don't have to use the term trust anchor, actually, but can refer to all these examples. Uh, we don't have to restate them here. Um, but I think it's a good set. And uh, Lawrence, I think it addresses your concern that uh, a, a, you have this key that is you, that you have it means something. Um, and that is uh, captured in the uh, trust anchor uh, uh, work in NetConf. So maybe have a look at that. And if you like it, maybe you can just refer it so that we have to restate everything that people are already bickered about for years. So when you're talking about trust anchors, that I want to comment on that because um, let's take the case where you're using an endorser service that's provided by the manufacturer, right? That was uh, the, the verifier still has to know how do I know whether to endorse the whether to trust the endorsement when it comes in via whatever the conveyance is, right? And so that means the endorsement itself is signed or comes in across a secure protocol. The whole point is the channel to the endorser or typically the endorsement itself is signed by a key that it needs to trust. Okay. And so how did you configure that thing? That is the trust anchor, right? It was the key of the, you know, the, the public key of the endorser, for example, right? And so what is your public key of the endorser is your trust anchor there. Um, my point about saying the endorser may not exist is when your trust anchor is just your trust anchor list is just a set of the keys of each tester individually. That's the trivial case where like a maker might use. But for scalability, you want an extra layer of indirection there, so you can have you know thousands of keys of a tester that are all signed by the same manufacturer key. I only need one thing in my trust anchor to manage, right? That's the scalability point that I was making. But you still need a trust anchor. How do I configure the endorser's key, right? You're not using a service to do that. You're, you're configuring it somehow, whether it's a manufacturing time, provisioning time, whatever. The verifier has to have has to have a way of managing its trust anchors, being its you know, endorser key, its verifier owner key, that type of thing, or a, a set of them, and the ability to keep them up to date if you rev the keys and so on. So what I hear you talking about, uh, Hank, is the trust anchor management, which is really about the keys for the endorser, the verifier owner. And if you don't have an endorser, then your trust anchor list contains keys of the attesters directly in those in that trivial special case. Yeah. <clears throat> so and there's there's lots of protocols and you know work that's been done to do that. But all of this said, outside the scope of rats. This is the architecture about how rats fits in the bigger picture, right? But those top three lines there. 
are outside the scope, except for by way of the architecture picture, like this discussion is fine. Right. So, so can you can the verifier do its job without an without an endorsement? Uh, depending on how you define endorsement, yes, absolutely. As long as the attester's signing key, meaning the attesting environments, that the root signing key of the attester is in the verifier's trust anchor list. For for example, if the manufacturer is also the <clears throat> the manufacturer of the attester is also the manufacturer of the verifier, and both keys are embedded at manufacturing time. Then exactly. yeah, that's that's the maker example, right? Where I'm at a hackathon, yeah. I've got five devices, and I do it all myself. Yeah. Okay, so sometimes keys uh, do come as endorsements, and sometimes they don't. Is what you're saying. Correct. It's only when you need that extra layer of indirection. We need a, a separate key to sign the attester's key. Well, I mean, the, 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 there's so many different keying schemes, and um, sometimes it's one level of indirection and sometimes two, and yeah. there could be all kinds of combinations. And it seems in an architecture, in architecture, I would prefer to say somehow uh, via one of these mechanisms, either, you know, bare keys or the most complicated X509 hierarchy you've ever seen, um, somehow uh, the key material gets into the verifier. And 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 it because it's so fundamental to uh, RAT's architecture. Second, when you say the key material, you have to explain what key material you're talking about. You're talking about the testers or the trust anchor, because those are two different things. Well, they may or may not be two different things. They could be the same or different. I, ref I when I re when I uh, refer to it, I refer to either you know individual symmetric bear keys or uh, the whole key hierarchy. Um, I refer to it all at once as as a one big concept of uh, somehow getting trusted key material into the verifier. The, the key of what? Sorry, the key corresponding to an attester. The key corresponding Enough, to what, whatever key, whatever. I mean, I'm trying to be somewhat abstract in general here. Um, whatever key material is necessary to establish trust with the attester. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. So then that would be the two right. sectors. That would be the right. it, so it could be the root of the most complicated X509 uh, hierarchy you've ever seen, or it could be you know one single. Uh, uh, no, no, there's key, there's key far. Error. That uh, configured into a million devices. Not a, neither are good designs, but it could be either any of those. I don't understand why you think configuring four trust anchors is complex. Well, it's not really specific to RAS either, exactly. right? That's all. It's not really specific to RAS, right? As Hank mentioned, you know, we do the same thing for Yang, for Yang. We do the same thing in Keep. Everything that uses security has to have trust anchor management of some sort, right? This is no different. So, so the, uh, just an extreme example. So, so the you know the one ex one extreme example, is really complicated, uh, uh, X5, 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 and, and, and the, one of the reasons it might be complicated is because you might be using TLS over IPsec, uh, over you know conveying a trust anchor that way or something like that. So, it, the, the trust might be really complicated, or it could be like just one 128 bit key that's shared by a million devices, and that's any of those so so can i interject here yeah go ahead so um I, I think that it would be a mistake to try to uh incorporate all these different kinds of ideas of establishing trust on evidence because that really is a, a question of the appraisal policy and what mechanism is used to do that appraisal for whatever particular kind of evidence is there whether or not you trust that evidence uh, through some other claim or some implicit claim in terms of an encryption is really a, in the eye of the appraiser itself. And all the mechanisms that the verifier uses, whether it's a cryptographic mechanism or an actual appraisal me mechanism, there has to be a way to get those in there, but I don't think we want to specify what that way is. I agree. I agree with you, Peter. I think uh, we don't want to have uh, much detail there because it could be heterogeneous and the actual details of those lines are out of scope for RAS, right? You just have to have such a line, I think, is sufficient yeah. to say. Yeah. And so whether it's symmetric or asymmetric or anything else, it doesn't matter at this level of thing. So, yeah, I agree with your point, Peter. Yeah, me too. Uh, but the architecture needs to allow for that full range of it and somehow... Sure, but it doesn't have to uh, go into any details about it. Right. right. 
Yep, absolutely. Okay. The, my opinion is the architecture document is not the place for such an exposition unless it really is RET specific. And I don't think trust anchor management is RET specific. No, I agree. But the definition is not, I think, yes. It relies heavily. So, and, and we, basically, we allow for all of it, but please do it in a good way so it is actually yeah. Yeah. trusted. Yeah, if there's some boilerplate, like if you find some uh, text that's stealable out of a Yang document that can be thrown into a security consideration section where we already talk about how the verifier trusts other things, that's fine. If not, my opinion is the current text is sufficient, but if you find some text that you think is is good, then I have no objections if we want to discuss bringing something else into. So. so a point that may need to be made, though, is that there is a relationship between the attester and the verifier when it comes to the mechanisms being used. And the point really is that, that there has to be a corresponding set of mechanisms on both sides that uh, allow you to identify what you expect out of that particular evidence presentation. And if that's cryptographic, then there needs to be a means to um, establish that cryptographic relationship. I'm just scanning through to see to what extent we talk about this at all in security considerations right now. Um, talking about properties, um, appraisal policies, security of conveyed information. I mean, it, whatever. Yeah, this needs to be part of the architecture and security considerations. I would just is more of a. I wouldn't think that would be. Where the, the where the architecture actually, would go. That wasn't the section I was looking for. The section I was looking for was the one that talks about who needs to trust whom. Uh, There's the trust uh, trust section. Yeah, know. that. I'm trying to find what section number is that. I don't know, but um, right before the definition of section seven. This is it. This is, that's actually good. So one of the things that leads us to the idea that we really need to have a, a negotiation for selecting evidence is just this kind of issue is that regardless of the reason why your policy whether it's an att a testing policy or an appraisal policy wants to choose a different mechanism the mechanism has to be actually chosen so that it it has the the right semantics and syntax to uh present evidence and then interpret it properly So the key material used to authenticate and integrity protect the conveyance channel. Okay, this is the uh, unprotected text. That's not the main text. Um, I guess this is the main text about the verifier trusts uh, the manufacturer or the manufacturer's hardware. So this could be more clear about saying uh, trust the endorser because this says it's a manufacturer and the endorser is only typically a manufacturer. Then we're typically using here. the term endorser okay. in this document. Yes, I didn't. I I didn't see. I oh, think. You're, you're actually. If we go back to the, let, let me look back at the picture here, the one that we had up before. Let me just scroll. It does say in there. paragraph used it. If you were okay, uh, as long as it's spelled right. Yeah, there. Okay, because it's not. It's not a defined term. Not. Yes, it is. Oh, there it is. Okay. Oh, we didn't define all right okay. typically a manufacturer I, I i like this phrase right just like we say typically typically that's all great uh so yes the term endorser is there but the section seven let me go back to section seven here i think section seven was uh inconsistent where it says what do you agree where it says here a manufacturer because it's a manu it's only typically a manufacturer so i believe that they should say it trusts an endorser yeah, and yeah, to whoever just met or whoever just said yes, endorsers up. Okay, so uh, yeah, we need to make this fix here for consistency. Okay. Uh, and so, so if, there's, if there's some place that we need to add, you know, any mention of trust anchors and stuff, this paragraph is not a bad place to add a sentence or something like that if necessary. So. So so we're we're still a. Uh, Endorsers sometimes have key material and some endorsements sometimes have key material and sometimes they don't. Is that is that still where we're, where we're at? Um, my opinion is at least under your definition of key material uh, that you talked about. At least what I understand what you mean by key material, it always has uh, endorsements always have key material, but key material don't have to come through an endorsement. Now, 
it would be okay if you wanted to call an endorsement, you can manually configure a key. Maybe you want to call that an endorsement. That's okay with me too. So. Okay, that, cause that's because I was trying to say the key material always comes through in an, an endorsement. So. Um, no, the key material, when the key material is different from the attester's key. In other words, if you have a key that signs the attester's key rather than using the attester's key in your trust anchor. See, I think that's if getting you into the attester's key in your trust anchor, then you have no endorsement. That's, that's getting into that mess of, of like trying to um, describe the details of the, the key hierarchy. And so an endorser, an endorsement okay. has, a, has a, is conditional on, on what your key, your, your key structure is. Okay. So I'm going to repeat back what I think is your position, right? Your position is, okay, let's take my special case and then describe how I think that you're saying that you want the language to apply. In the special case where you don't have a separate endorser, right? You're just putting each of your, you know, three attesters keys in your trust anchor list, right? Then you're saying the ability to configure the attesters key into the trust anchor list, you would call the endorsement. Yeah. That's what's configuring the the key material into the trust anchor list. So anything that puts a, a key into the trust anchor list that's used to verify trust in attesters, you would call that an endorsement. Correct. I mean, I'm just trying to fit. fit I'm okay with that. To the architecture. Well, what would we call the configuration of the um, owner's key into the trust anchor list for the verifier, or the name. relying party's key into the verifier's trust anchor list? We don't have a name. Uh, I guess you could call it. There, there's not a name for it. I would not invent a name for it. <clears throat> uh, so, but we did sort of we did sort of say that early on. We said so that in one of the very first iterations of the architecture, we had um, a whole section that was focused on managing trust and you know configuring trust anchor and the overall from the group was, no, we don't need to put all that in the architecture spec. We can we're good enough with, yeah, we all know how to configure trust. So the, the relationship between the, the, the attester and the I agree with that, is very special and, and very unique to, to, to rats. The, the relationship between the, uh, the, and that key material and all that is, it's, it's, it's like the, the absolute core of, of rats. Um, so, I don't think that that's the same as true, like for the relationship between the verifier and the relying party, or the verifier owner and the and the verifier. Those are just standard IT practices, and they're not specific to rats. They, but the, the, the that key key relationship between the attester and the verifier, I think, is and and I think that needs to be made explicit. I still agree with Ned. As I don't think it's rat specific, so I don't think it needs to be made explicit. I don't know if it's worth asking the rest of the working group and stuff, but right now Ned's summary actually matches where I'm at inside my own head. Um, I, I'm open to discussion, right? But I think right now I'm leaning towards just uh, applying what Ned said. And and what say again? What what Ned said? <clears throat> we 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 as a we as a group decided that we didn't want to have um, a second trust anchors are managed because that was thought to be unnecessary. We we had it in there at one point. I, I, I agree with that. Um, can can I inject one 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 point? If we're if we're go ahead, Greg. If we're talking about like what's specific kind of to a remote attestation versus kind of more traditional things where trust anchors are used, then it seems both the line of evidence in and attestation results out of the verifier are in that space and and the the issue i brought up um uh, filed in the in the in the um in github um is there's so for there's there's trust of the key and there's trust of handling of the key so for example the relying party may say gets it signed at the station results and it's trust of that signing key may be both a combination of the key and the handling of the key and the handling of the key may be um uh, verified or proven by yet another attestation, by, by evidence that from, from the attester, by the verifier functioning as, as an attester also and providing evidence as to its handling of that key material. So it's in some of these flows here, or at least the, the attestation results one, uh, from what, we, what I've seen, 
um, and I'm new to this space, um, it's it, the uh, the trust anchor is more complex than simply a key. It's also the, the provable handling of the key. So there has been discussion about the idea that we could use attestation to augment trust anchor management, uh, automated trust anchor management, so that we can have some trust context for for that management and that attestation. That that would be an, a use case of attestation, and I agree with that. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I agree, Ned. Um, so we got about 15 minutes left in the call, and there's another aspect, I think, of what uh, Lawrence's PR raised as a second part and the second question that I think would be useful for us to uh, discuss, right? Because, um, Lawrence, you start off by saying, hey, what do people think an endorsement is and what's the relationship to the key material? There is another part of that discussion, which I think we did have before, and we might be revisiting it, um, but since there's new people on the call, it might be useful, which is what's the relationship between endorsements and reference values or known good values, right? That was another part of your questions, right? Yeah, was, that was the second thing I wanted to bring up. Yes. Yeah. So should we uh, bleed into that now? So we got at least a couple minutes to discuss that. Yeah. Um, so I have my own opinion on that, but anybody else want to go first? And what's the relationship between reference <laughs> values and endorsements? So uh, let me let me say what I was what I was after. Um, go ahead. So uh, known good values can come through endorsements um, or through appraisal policy, and either one. That's all fine, and all that. Um, but I believe there's another case going on here where um, things come into the verifier from the endorser, probably an endorsement, and they're not known good values. They are implied or implicit claims that are just stuck into the attestation result. They, they're piped, piped through the verifier. The, um, the verifier knows that the, it can do that because the, it established the trust relationship with the attester and knows the identity of the attester. So these are just, and this, and the, these are uh, claims that are passed on to the relying party for the relying party to make the decision. So the relying party may decide to, to like the, the the identity of the manufacturer may come through an endorsement, um, and the relying party wants to make a decision based on the identity of the manufacturer. You know, maybe the country of origin or something. Um, so the, that's another aspect of what endorsements are, is these claims that are kind of implied claims that are passed through. And so I, I was wondering, like, where is, is there consensus on that? Um, uh, or if not, where do, where do these implied claim, claims come from? Um, I, I, think, I think we had something about this. It's like the, uh, on behalf, we had some text sometime, maybe it's corrupt already, there was on, claims on behalf of the attester. Mm -hmm. So, so, so the attester doesn't bring them with it in evidence, but because there's some now a trust relationship with the attester, you can have some implied claims on behalf of the attester come from the outside. I think the text was scrapped, but I think that is something you are referring to right now, Lance. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, it, it was like from a year year or two ago. It was the difference between implicit and explicit claims? Yeah, Ned, were you trying to say something? Yeah, I yeah, I think I think we all. Uh, um, I think with this agreement, at least in the acknowledgement that there are two types of claims, um, maybe the wording is, we, we're struggling with wording, but uh, there, there's a set of claims that we refer to as static or implicit, I don't know what the right word is, but it's essentially something that the endorser says that is an invariant. In other words, uh, the attester doesn't have to say the same thing because it never changes, and the endorser can say it directly to the verifier, and because of the trust establishment between the endorser and verifier, the verifier accepts it without having to cross-check it with evidence. And there's really no point in doing that because it's invariant, and so it's never going to change. So there's really no point in it. It so, could it could change. I, I I want to give my answer, but first I'm going to give the rationale for my answer, uh, and then I'll get to my answer. Um, if uh, and the analogy that I'm going to give is to uh, layered attestation, right? And so, remember, at the if you have layered attestation, then at the root of the attester, you have an attesting environment, right? You have a testing environment and a target environment, right? And so, all an endorser is is it's analogous to being an attesting environment for the bottom of the attester as the target environment. And so, if I go back to this picture here, 
And because we've said these environments in some senses could even be on different chips or devices, right? So all the difference is pretend that this box in the middle here is the attester, or at least the bottom of the attester, right? So if this and up is the attester, this right here is equivalent to an endorser, right? And this piece coming up is actually an endorsement, right? It's the thing that signs claims about the target environment, which is the attesting environment and the attester, right? And so in that sense, these uh, claims are just the same as just an evidence in any other attesting environment, right? The endorser is just an attesting environment who did the attesting at manufacturer time. And in one example, right, if they never change, then of course you can keep resupplying the evidence and it never expires because it's burned into hardware, or ROM or whatever it is, right? That's just a special case, right? But to me, uh, claims in, in, in an endorsement is no different from these claims here. It's just claiming information like, oh, the, the manufacturer value of the target environment, which is the root attesting environment is such and such, right? The model number is whatever. Those are perfectly valid because they would have been valid in any, if you look in the, if I forget the endorsement for a second, I look at a layered attestation and a testing environment could have similar claims about any target environment, right? The evidence for B could include things like that, right? Who wrote the software for target environment B could be a claim in here as measured by a testing environment A. That would be possible. Uh, to me, an endorsement is no different than an evidence. The only difference is the testing environment here happens to typically be a manufacturer way off somewhere like in a service. And this first leg here is across a protocol rather than inside of a device, right? But that's how I look at claims in the endorsement. And that's why is because I look at it as just another step below in the attestation hierarchy where the just the bottom of the, the layers. So they're not necessarily known good values. There are, there are things that can be just put in the attestation result. Um, so let me come to that part now in my own opinion, right? Known good values would be part of, an, uh, of what you would call an endorsement if and only if known good values would be part of what you'd call evidence in an attesting environment signing a target environment, okay? Now, it's not out of the question that any attesting environment could put known good values about target environment B to be put up to the verifier. It's possible, but another way to do that is that the known good values are in addition to the evidence. And so one way to phrase it is, I'm just gonna flip back to their picture now. The, and this is what I put into my comment, or at least what I meant by my comment, because I think there's two valid models and a different conveyance protocols could use different models, right? Uh, here. Um, so, and you said this when you introduced this, Lawrence, is, is um, it is possible for known good values to come from an endorser, sorry, from a manufacturer, let me put it that way, um, where endorsements come and reference values, known good values come in addition to the things that are called endorsements being the claims. So that's provided separately, even in the same conveyance protocol. And that just comes in and gets unioned with the appraisal policy for evidence. Um, and you kind of mentioned that coming in, it says, okay, the appraisal policy for evidence could come across multiple sources, right? This could be a combination where the verifier owner collects stuff from multiple sources, puts it together in the verifier, or maybe these come into the verifier via different conveyance protocols. So it's possible for the manufacturer to have reference values that come into the appraisal policy for evidence line independent of the endorsements, or it's possible for them to come in claims just as a, uh, a testing environment could have put known good values into any claims about a target environment. Right. Both of those are valid and I would not want to constrain it to one or the other, but that was a long version of, of why uh, <clears throat> I'll define the endorsement in the equivalent of claims in evidence. So, so, so uh, we did have the conversation long ago where the endorser uh, endorsement was flowing into the owner and then the owner was flowing into the verifier and we said we didn't want, want that. Correct. I, I would not change the diagram here in any way. I agree with that, um, but I'm just explaining why personally um, I define endorsements as not necessarily including reference values, even if you're using reference values. They could or they may not if it comes to a different line. And I, and I think I just wanted to, you know, I think that the the term reference value is implying that there is some sort of a check between two values, a reference value and an actual value. That's different from a set of endorsements that wouldn't uh, fit as where the term reference wouldn't necessarily fit because the, there isn't a corresponding actual value necessarily, right? Yep, yep, agree. Can you give an example of that? Partially, when, yeah, I'll, uh, 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 so I'll try to say two things. One example is uh, where your appraisal policy is comparing a value of claim A against value of claim B, right? That's an example, there's no reference value. Another example sort of in between is where you're comparing it for uh, it's not a known good value, it's a known bad value. So for example, an expiration time, right? 
when the timestamp equals this, as soon as it's equal, it's a known bad value, right? And it's a less than is the operation that you're doing. And it will be a, ref a less than against a reference value, but it's not a known good value, it's a known bad value, right? And so it's kind of in between. Um, what I was- I, I was thinking of the case. I was thinking of the- to me, when I use the term endorsement, I, I uh, so far in the working group in the past, I have typically used the term endorsement to refer to data that uh, is specific to an attester. So it could be multiple attesters have the same data, like what's the manufacturer name and so on. Um, but it is specifically saying this key, you know, this attester key has this particular uh, manufacturer and so on. If I say that uh, this model number has a known good value for property X of one, two, three, right? That's not something specific to an attester. And so I put that outside the definition of what I call an endorsement, which is a statement about a particular attester. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, I think of, uh, I kind of use the example of, uh, say, FIPS certification as an example of endorsement that doesn't have a corresponding reference. Yep. For which you would not expect to have a corresponding actual value and call it a reference value. Uh -huh. So you, in, in this example, you're saying whether or not and what level of FIPS certification an attester achieved would come through an endorsement and then flow to the relying party. It would come through the endorsement to the verifier. The attester would be silent in terms of evidence. Right. The appraisal policy would say, you know, I have a policy that you have to meet this level of FIPS in order for the answer to be yes. But the but that that decision can be made by either the verifier or the relying party. It's okay. I mean that. Yeah. yeah. That's what you said, Lawrence. Right. It, that. It is possible for that to then flow through into attestation results with the verifier to say, and the vote yes. to the level such and such, and then the relying party can use that for its authorization decision. Yeah. And to point out, it's that, that that is largely static, but not necessarily, uh, because that, that FIPS certification could have been added later, later on, or it could be taken away. Yeah, yeah. And so that's There's why always, the policy for there, evidence can be done. Yeah. There, the, yeah, and there is the question of how long, you know, do, do endorsements expire, you know? What's the validity yeah, period for endorsements? Three minutes left. <laughs> yeah, I think that the life cycle of endorsement is super interesting, but I think not for today. Um, my question back to Lauren would be, is that enough food of thought for you to uh, um, uh, remodel your... Yeah, yeah, I think I'm, I'm stuffed. <laughs> okay, well, uh, maybe it's a bit to stop before you explode then. <laughs> Okay, is so this is this actionable? That's my question. Is this actionable to you, Lawrence? Good question. I think so. Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll uh, do some work on this and see where it, where it comes out. I'm not quite sure yet, but. Okay. If, any last comments from people? We don't want to make Lawrence's head explode. He's already stuffed. So. Uh... I'd like to make a quick one. What, one way to think about uh, what the inertia, that kind of sums up what Dave was saying earlier is that there's a rich sources or, or a variety of sources for additional evidence that a verifier may use besides evidence directly provided by an attester. And I kind of look at that line, this label is endorser as the source of all things that would be that. And that goes from everything from a key that could be used to verify the claims of a, uh, an encrypted uh, evidence from the attester to other att testing things from other environments or things like uh, the, the values that were, were put in. And, and that, in my mind, takes care of that whole endorsement line. It doesn't quite get everything, and some you have to look over to that um, appraisal policy line. And there's some things like known good values that are really particular to the appraisal policy. For instance, a PCR value, um, it must be a certain value. That, that can be used as a, as a constraint on looking at the evidence. And so even if the path is the same, it comes from a, uh, a, a manufacturer's uh, sheet or, or whatever, that is logically different than the endorsement idea. It's really part of the appraisal. Yep, I agree. Thanks, Peter. Makes sense. All right. Anyone else before we close the call? Okay. Hearing nothing, uh, it sounds like we have some action items. Thank you to those of you who have volunteered. Um, and look forward to talking about uh, Hannes' comments and so on that we didn't get to, or uh, Kathleen's, whatever we didn't get to next week. So thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye.
Bye.